Okay. All right, let's go. Welcome to the world of ECMO. Well, thank you very much for this invite. I really appreciate being able to do this. This is always a lot of fun. So what we're going to talk about, the next, um, no disclosures. The next hour, we're going to talk about what is ECMO, what history of ECMO, where it came from, different styles, quickly. Circuit a little bit, but mostly we're going to focus on patient populations, the different kinds, neonatal, pediatric versus adult, what are the similarities, what are the differences, why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, as we, everybody knows, we're talking to a group of perfusionists. We're talking mostly about ECMO, which is cardiopulmonary bypass, which is a lot longer than what you would be doing in the OR. It can be days or weeks or months. There was a report out of North Carolina of a woman that was waiting on a lung transplant on ECMO, was ambulatory, was able to stay on ECMO for about 13 months. Oh my God. Uh, waiting on her lung. Finally, she got a lung transplant and was doing, and ended up doing very, very well. But she was on for over 13 months. So a quick little historical background about where ECMO came from and what, uh, how it relates is uh, 1885, von Schroeder discovered uh, if you bubbled oxygen through a vat of blood, it turns bright red, which from that he was able to discover that ox blood is what transports oxygen to the tissues. 1916, Dr. McLean discovered heparin in the pancreas. 2030s, in the 30s, 1930s, John Gibbons was the main character in this entire story. Back in the 30s, as an intern, uh, his job as an intern was to sit at the bedside of, a, of the patient and document the patient's vitals. One night he was assigned to a patient that had a, a pulmonary emboli. And as he was sitting throughout the night documenting this woman's uh, vital signs getting worse and worse and worse throughout the whole night, he came up with the idea that if I were to take blood out of the right side of her heart, oxygenate it, and put it on the left side of her heart, I would be able to save this woman. So from that little kernel of information, he and his wife Mary, who was a lab tech at the time, came up with the first idea of how to create the first oxygenator. Um, throughout the 30s and 40s, uh, during the wars, uh, one of the things that was invented, Dow Chemical came out and invented silicone rubber. And from that, Dr. Gibbons was able to determine that if you take a thin layer of silicone, you put blood on one side of it and a gas on the other side, through the act of diffusion, molecules of high concentration would go from one side to the other. So CO2 would go out and oxygen would come in. So from that, after much trial and error, took about 20 years, uh, he finally had his first adult survivor in 1953, which was an 18-year-old with uh, VSD. Cecilia Babalik was her name. Was her name? That's what was her name. Okay. 1971, after much experimenting, we had our first adult ECLS survivor. And in 1974, we had Esperanza, our first ECMO neonatal survivor. 1979, the National Institute of Health got involved and wanted to determine whether what we were doing with this new animal called ECMO was as effective as the medicine that we were doing at that time. Well, being able to prove that ECMO was as advantage, was even just as good as what was being done was pretty easy to do because in 1979, we didn't know a lot about what we know now. Our medicine was actually pretty medieval back then. We didn't know a lot about, and we're gonna talk about some of the things that we learned since then. So we got past that trial pretty easily. So in the 1980s, Dr. Bartlett got involved in the University of Michigan. He got together and created a, had a couple of trials. We had the Boston, Michigan trials, and then we had an explosion of ECMO centers, and we're gonna look at why that was in just a little bit. As of January of 2016, there is almost 300 centers worldwide, that is, and that has continued to explode. We're gonna talk about why in a little bit. 1996, uh, we had the Lancet UK trial. I don't want to interrupt you, but you say the ECMO centers yes. as of uh, 298 worldwide. Yes. Those are ECMO centers specifically that report to ELSO. That's correct. So that's not total. That's correct. That's, these are the centers that collect data and are voluntary members of, of ELSO. Okay. There are lots of places that do bypass and do ECMO that don't report and aren't voluntary members, but uh, just the members that do report to ELSO, and I, that is a majority at, at that time, mm -hmm. that do ECMO, there was almost 300 at that point. Yes, now, two years later, there's even more. We're going to look at that graph in a little bit. 
that do it. Mm -hmm. 1992 is when Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital got started doing ECMO. And January of 2018, later, the last time they reported data out, worldwide there was almost 100,000 patients on ECMO, of which 68% have survived and 56 of them survived to discharge. Again, this is all data that is being reported out of ELSO. Mm -hmm. There are lots of other centers that, like we said, do it that the data isn't reflected here. Mm -hmm. But and I don't mean to interrupt you, in but mind. just to be sure. So, so first of all, okay, 1992, uh, Memorial Hermann started their ECMO. When did you start here? I started doing ECMO in 2000. 2000, so eight years after they first opened that up here, pediatric ECMO, and then you have here 68% uh, survived, uh, 56 to discharge, so 68% survived the ECMO run. Mm -hmm. Is that combined VA and VV? That's combined everything. Combined VA, everything. VA, VA, VA. Okay. Um, and also cardiac plus the respiratory okay. exposure. So here's a picture of one of the very first oxygenators that they used back in the 50s. What they did was they took layers of silicone and sandwiched them all together with mesh and every other channel flowing in one direction, you can kind of see, does my mouth show up on when I do that? No. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, that's okay. They have, uh, you can see the tubes coming out, collecting the blood, taking it back to the patient. And you can see the big tank of gas and the sweep gas being split into many different tubes being sent counter currently. So this is one of the very first ones being held together, big giant C-clamps. So one of the very first studies that was ever done was done by Dr. Bartlett back in 1985. And he did a study uh, with two different arms, with one arm being the ECMO patients and the other arms being conventional ventilation. And the way he randomized his patients to do the two different arms was something that he called uh, play the winner. And the way that works is, Whatever patient was first entered into the study was randomized to one arm or the other, and I'm not sure how they did it. They rolled dice or tic-tac-toe or whatever, but the patient got randomized to one of the arms. And the idea was they would continue on that same arm with every sub subsequent patient as long as each patient continued to live. And when the first patient that died on that arm, they would stop on that arm and go to the other arm and do the same thing, continue to put patients on until somebody died. And then they would compare the two numbers and figure out which one was better. Well, luckily for everybody in the study, the first arm they got randomized to was the ECMO arm. So for the next 11 patients in a row, they all lived and then finally one of them died. And then they went over to do the control ventilation arm and the very first patient out of the gate died. So they compared the two numbers and said, okay, well, this is no brainer. We've got 11 versus zero, so ECMO obviously is, the better, is better than what conventional ventilation. Well, as you might imagine, the randomization idea was not very well thought of. So a few years later, a guy named John O'Rourke came together and said, Dr. Bartlett, we love you, but we need to redo this. This needs to be done better. So he did the exact same idea where he had two different arms. He had ECMO and he had conventional ventilation. But he did a proper randomization where he did uh, every single patient got properly randomized to one arm or the other. And you can see his results there. 60% of the control patients died, where 97% of the uh, patients treated with ECMO lived. Well, that gave That's him a huge. Yeah, well, it gave him a p-value of 5%. His sample size is a little low with 39, but he's had a good p-value. And uh, for those of that have forgotten statistics from the many years ago you took in college, p-value, you want that to be 5% or less. If it is, your hypothesis is supported. So this guy was right on the money, right at 5%. And so it was a good study for the time. The only problem was is he had such a small sample size. So Giles Peak over in the UK got together and he did this similar study where he would transport patients into four tertiary centers that did ECMO and neonatal ECMO and then randomized them. And he had a large sample size. His sample size was 185. Similarly, 59% of those control patients died, but only 28% of his ECMO patients died, which gave him a p-value of 0.05%. So large sample size, properly randomized, great study that was done at the time, although the only caveat we have nowadays is that it was done in 1996. So 
it's an old study and medicine has certainly changed since 1996. However, it was a very large, expensive study and no one is ever going to redo this on neo-respiratory ECMO ever again. So this is one of the main studies that people point to when they say neo-respiratory ECMO works and this is why. So keep that in mind however because we're going to come back and look at this in a minute about what has changed since 1996. Here's a map of the world with all the ELSO centers that uh, report to ELSO. And you can see we are now got ECMO going on on every single continent except one. Here is a map of Texas and all the ELSO centers that we have in Texas. And there's Houston down below. Um, us at the top, we've got uh, St. Luke's, TCH, Methodist. All right, so now let's start talking a little bit about similarities and differences of adult versus kids. So one of the things that came about in the 70s and 80s when we first started trying to do adult respiratory ECMO, it was very unsuccessful. And the reason was, was because everybody was cannulating everybody through the femoral vein and the femoral artery. And so you were having oxygenated blood flowing countercurrent up the aorta and the native heart was pushing native cardiac output back down the aorta, so eventually the oxygenated ECMO blood would get turned around and go in the right direction. However, it wouldn't quite make it up to the coronaries, it wouldn't quite make it up to the carotids, and so you had a very pink patient, you had a very oxygen, you drew a blood gas, he was very oxygenated. Why in the world has this guy got a dead brain and have a, why has he got a dead heart? So a lot of people threw their hands up and said, well this doesn't work. Adult ECMO doesn't work. Well, doing it this style, yeah, it doesn't work very well. Sometimes this does work when you have to make it work, well, like when you're having a patient that's having a cardiac event and you're having to emergently cannulate them. However, we have since learned that if you put uh, a venous cannula in the femoral vein and you put a, your return into your jugular and you start doing VV ECMO, especially with adult respiratory cases, they do extremely well. Um, now you've got uh, a high cardiac output, you've got high myocard, uh, a, a, a crit, and you've got lots of oxygen delivery, and now your coronaries are seeing good oxygen delivery, and your brain is seeing good oxygen delivery. So now, here we are, um, having lots of good success with adult respiratory ECMO, and this is why just the thought process of changing between one and the other. Okay, so that's adult ECMO. So kids, if you look at the third image there, you can see this is an example of a kid that's on uh, respiratory VA ECMO through the neck. Um, we've got a jugular uh, cannula going down into his right atrium, and we have an arterial cannula that goes down the carotid that goes to just right above the aortic arch. Taking blood out of the right atrium, oxygenating it and putting it into the left side just like Dr. Gibbons wanted to do back in the 30s. This works really well. And then the last example is of a, patient, a cardiac patient that we've got an open chest. You've got a cannula in the right atrium and you've got a cannula in the aorta um, with, through an open chest. But we've seen that a lot of times in adult patients as well, you know, with post-cardiotomy syndrome where they can't be weaned from bypass and we just leave them centrally cannulated and, uh, and go from there. But I had a question for you though on this, I don't mean to, to, to stop you or, or, or interrupt you, but on the uh, carotid artery cannulation, mm -hmm. um, is there not a concern of, of, uh, of you know, having problems with perfusion with the cannulation? How, do, how does that get addressed? When we first started doing this type style cannulation back in the 90s, there was a concern about losing that carotid supply to the brain. So after, an ec after ECMO runs, they would go back in and, and take out the cannula, recreate the carotid, and they started having tr horrible uh, events with showering the brain with microclots. So they, took, they bit the bullet, tied off the carotids these days, and they, they don't have any uh, sequelae from having just one jugular and one carotid. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as long as you have an intact circle of Willis, correct, correct. Or uh, and 
everybody that's involved with ECMO is extremely careful with what they're doing with heparinization, brain protection, mm -hmm. all of that. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. But in the midst of having a patient that is uh, decompensating, needing to go on bypass, going, needing to go on ECMO, you don't have the luxury of taking them down, getting imaging and, and making that, sure. Right. Correct. You just have to do it. You got to bite the bullet. Bite. You know, it's one extreme or the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now after doing this this um, experience with cannulation, we started coming up with some ideas of how can we combine the two ideas together and come up with a way to, to get the best of all these worlds. Mm -hmm. That's when we started getting uh, fancy and started doing VVA, where we have a large cannula in the femoral vein coming out, we oxygenate it, comes back around, and then we split it. Half of it goes into your jugular, so you've got the VV benefits, and then other half of it goes into the carotid, so now you've got the VA benefit too. So you've got augmented cardiac output with oxygenated blood, and you've got oxygenated blood going through the lungs, hitting the coronaries and perfusing the brain. So yes, you do have all of the same benefits, but now you've also got a lot of the same bad things that you need to be aware of. Any kind of uh, clot, air, bubble, bit of plastic from, from uh, the roller pump, it's going to end up going somewhere bad. So everything, you know, just trade off on all through medicine. Every time you find something that helps, there's always something bad that you got to keep an eye on, and this is a great example of that. Okay, so here's a picture of one of Dr. Gibbons' uh, bypass machines way back in the 50s. Um, he's got his big tank of gas. You can see he's got an electric motor there turning the pump. It's, looks pretty medieval, but did the job. Did really well. So when is ECMO needed generally? When tissue oxygen requirements are not being met by biologic organs, conventional care usually manifested by progressing metabolic and or lactic acidosis, mixed venous desaturation, and or multi multiple organ failures. Irrever when irreversible biologic organ damage is occurring with conventional care. When expected mortality likelihood approaches 80% with conventional care. So this is an example, this is a data from ELSO going back to January of 2013 shows all the different reasons on why we would put a patient on neonatal respiratory ECMO. Mm -hmm. You can see it's broken out. The biggest column we've got there is diaphragmatic hernias. And you can see we're about 50% successful with those. This graph shows usage of ECMO starting in 1990, neo respiratory, neonatal respiratory ECMO. 1992 was our heyday. Since then it has dropped way off in the 90s and then it's kind of stabilized out. And these are the reasons why. In 1992, uh, we started trialing nitric oxide. Then we did a trial of high frequency. Then we did a trial of high frequency plus the nitric oxide. Then we did a trial with surfactant. And finally, in the year 2000, the FDA approved the use of nitric oxide. And then also since this, we've come up with high, low ventilation strategies, for lung protection ideas. And so because of that, a lot of the reasons why we went on ECMO um, has fallen off. Way back in the day when we first started doing this, meconium aspiration was the main reason we'd put these kids on. Um, since then, we've learned how to treat meconium aspiration without having to put them on ECMO. So going back to what you were just talking about, not having to lose a jugular when we can support these patients on conventional ventilation and the carotid More so. is beneficial. Okay, so keep this in mind because we're going to circle back to this idea in a few minutes. So how are patients identified who might benefit from ECMO? Unlike neonatal ECMO, there are no broadly accepted pediatric or adult ECMO indications. The goal is to identify the 80 to 90 percent mortality likelihood without ECMO. You must have a reversible disease process. You got to have an exit strategy. Oxygen index has to be greater than 40, or your Murray score has to be greater than 3. And you can also do an A to A quotient or your perfusion perf quotient, but it's a whole lot easier just to use A to A uh, oxygen index or your Murray score. Okay, so here's the similar graphs that we were looking at for neorespiratory. Now this is the pediatric respiratory uh, data from January of 2013. And you can see other is the biggest category there, but if you take away the word other, viral pneumonias and respiratory failure combined make the largest uh, contribution. And so, 
the graph for pediatric respiratory ECMO looks very different than the one we have for NEO. You can see we kind of stabilized out in the, in the year in the 2000s, but then we started taking off in the year 2009 is when we really started exploding. And this relates to the adult experience we're going to look at in depth in just a minute. So keep the year 2009 in mind because we're going to circle back to that year. Okay, so PD and NEO cardiac ECMO. These are the different reasons why you put a patient on and congenital defects are the largest percentage. The data is from, again from January 2013 and we're about 50% successful. These patients live about 50% of the time coming out on ECMO. And here's the respiratory, uh, respiratory adult respiratory experience. We've got viral pneumonias, bacterial pneumonias, and adult respiratory failures. Take away the other, and you can see that those are the two. Now here is a shocking graph. 2009, you can see we were pretty stagnant on adult respiratory all the way through 2009, and then things just exploded, took off. And you can see the success rate at the very end is about 43%. Now, if you put these graphs all together, you can see that the neo-respiratory drops way off. It's less than 10% of our business these days. The biggest percentage of what we are doing for ECMO these days are adult respiratory and uh, pediatric respiratory. So how, are, how is adult and pediatric ECMO different? So they're actually more alike than they are different. Some of the things to keep in mind is that mechanical ventilation prior to ECMO for the most part, at about 10 days of high ventilatory support is when we would uh, consider the patient's not a candidate. But for an adult, those days are about six, only about six days. So once you reach 10 days in the PD, six days in the adult, you're essentially no longer a candidate for mechanical pulmonary support. There's been uh, quite a few studies that have shown that at 10 days of high ventilatory support for the pediatric kids, world, um, those lungs have been damaged to the point that they're irre uh, irreversible, that we end up with uh, futile care. Um, and on the adult world, the, the adult lungs don't take uh, very kindly to a high ventilator settings any, any more than the kids do, but even less so. Mm -hmm. so and, and, and let me, can I, can, you don't mind, you don't mind interruption, because this is something that, that, that is very troublesome to me. Those numbers that you quoted on the adult ECMO with mm -hmm. a overall survival of 43%, that's pulmonary, yes. pulmonary. Yes. But the range on that is very different. The range is, can be quite high. And the argument is always you put, you're putting patients on ECMO that could have done without it. And so, you know, even though you may just write, you know, you have these two different criteria, when you should consider ECMO and when it is absolutely indicated. But how many of those patients that contributed to that number being 43%, that that number would be much higher if they didn't wait six days five days, six days, or seven days, and then put those patients on ECMO. How much mm -hmm. of that do you believe? If you know the answer, fine. If not, maybe your opinion. But how much of that do you think contributed to that number being 43% overall when I would think it would be much higher than that? Well, there's that viewpoint, but then there's the opposite viewpoint that a lot of these patients that do get put on was put on at a much l too late of a date and they end up dying, and they would have probably been, uh, they probably would have died with or without ECMO anyway. So those add to the negative part of that equation. Mm -hmm. And then yes, putting these patients on too early, uh, but then they do okay. Um, so, it, so yes, it, it very much befuddles the whole equation. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got different centers that all have different criteria about when they put a patient on. So. Um, one, of the one of the benefits of ELSO is, is all the data collection that we do and the ability to drive a uh, centralized criteria for patients. However, there will always be um, 
individualistic components to this equation. Um, you know, the physician at two in the morning who puts a patient on because they're panicked, okay, or the patient that waits way, way, way too late, I can do it without, I can do it without putting on ECMO. They view putting a patient on ECMO as a failure. So they wait, they wait, they wait, and then finally, oh, I've run out of things to do. Let's, okay, let's put them on ECMO. Mm -hmm. So you can predict that outcome. There easily. you go, there you go. Mm -hmm. So you put all these together and yeah, you're right. That, that number 43 could be completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, one of the things to use for trying to come up with a, 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 a group idea of uh, patient selection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good, okay. All right, so some of the differences between adult and kids. Uh, differences in size is gonna, definitely going to cause difficulty in nursing care. And, uh, uh, one of the goals we have for uh, respiratory cases when they've been on for a while is we want to try and get them sitting up in bed and getting them ambulatory um, and then uh, actually having them walk. The case that we were referring to when we first started from North Carolina, the woman that was on for 13 months, she was up walking around every single day and she actually was able to walk herself all the way down to the first floor and they have pictures of her sitting out on a patio just seeing the outside and then coming back. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they have to keep them conditioned so they can tolerate the lung transplant. That's exactly right, exactly right. So every single day she looked forward to her PT uh, sessions and was very involved with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so differences in sizes, um, you gotta keep, you know, as these patients are being mobilized, moved, turned, even if they're not being out of bed, just turning them back and forth, changing linens and stuff, it's a whole lot more difficult with an adult patient. You're having to keep uh, a close eye on the, a close eye on the uh, cannulas, uh, the IVs. You got to make sure nothing is coming out to being dislodged. Um, You're getting closer to me. I know I am. I was being directed. Yeah. <laughs> the boss told me. Um, so. And then with kids, you know, the smaller the neonates, you're not going to be mobilizing them. You're not going to be moving them around. However, it's still the same idea. Easier to move, you still got to keep an eye on the cannulas. What do you think about the rotoprone? Because we've been doing mm. ECMO with the rotoprone. Really? Yes. And how's that going? It's good. I mean, it actually, I have to tell you, from my observation, and of course this is very anecdotal, uh, but those patients that we have done that with have done extremely well. Wow. So, uh, and we, this is with an Avalon in general speaking. So we'll have a, a, a regular, you know, dual lumen Avalon, mm -hmm. VV ECMO in the right IJ, and uh, we've, uh, we've transitioned them to the rotor prone bed and have had, like I said, have had remarkable success. But anecdotally, you know, we don't have that huge a, a population of them, um, and maybe, you know, four or five or six maybe at the tops. That would be scary. That would be very interesting to watch. It's I bet the first time bad. you did that, I bet the first time you did that, there were a lot of uptight people, I'm sure. Yes, it is a bit nerve-wracking when they when they flip the patient. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, but once you you know once you get used to it, you do you set the lines up coming out the, through the top. Okay. And you just watch your lines and the thing turns and it's uh, it really is not that bad. Okay. It's not that hard. Okay. But it's very, I mean, I have to tell you, but again, observationally, um, it's worked extremely well. Nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Okay. Anticoagulation, there are some little differences. Uh, with the pediatric, yes. it's almost always heparin based. There are some centers that are experimenting with uh, Biral, Bival, and some others. However, for the most part, most pediatric centers, like heparin, they've used it for many, many, many years. They're comfortable with it. They know the downsides and they're watching for it. We use ACTs and anti-10As to titrate it. The adult world, they use bival uh, a lot. They start with heparin, but they quickly transition over to bival and using PTT and TEGS to monitor the, the titration for that. Mm -hmm. That's one of the main differences. Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit, if we may. And, and again, I hope you don't mind this, this method of style. Uh, because I can't remember all of these questions by the time you're through, but um, on the on the low range ACT, my my experience with with uh, the ACT LR is um, is that it's it's can be all over the place. I can draw the same sample, 
run it on two different machines and get one result that says you need to intervene with either a bolus of heparin or going up on the drip, and the other one you're giving too much heparin and you need to turn your drip down. It's very um, user um, specific. Uh, the caregiver at the bedside that most specialist, whoever's drawing it, um, you can have a very similar heparin infusion between two different shifts and get two different results, uh, two different ranges. Simply, simply from technique. Um, we use it mostly for trending. Uh, the gold standard that we're using these days for heparinization is the anti-10A for the kids. And then once that's set, we're using the ACTs as the trending tool just to determine whether uh, we, we are gonna be in range or not with the mm -hmm. 10As. Mm -hmm. um, so you're exactly right, the, uh, the ACT when we first started all this years ago, it was the it was the bomb. Everybody wrote home about it. This was the perfect thing ever. And then we would have two patients side by side, exact same ACTs, one circuit clotting off and the other one bleeding out. And we've since learned, uh, you know, how to do things better. And so we'll, I don't have much pediatric experience, um, but um, for uh, for for the adults. I, you know, we prefer, I prefer to use the, uh, the APTT. And uh, I think that the Society, of Critical, Critical, the Society of Critical Care Medicine recommends that and at 1.5 times baseline. Mm -hmm. um, now our flows, even though your surface area in the pediatric world may be much lower, much smaller still, our flows through these devices is very high, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the transit time is very low. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you think that contributes to some of your thrombotic problems that oh, you have. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the difference in the circuit sizes is not as much as you would think. A quarter inch circuit and a three eighths inch circuit, the uh, actual volume, priming volume is very, is very similar, but your flows, when you're flowing five liters a minute on an adult versus 300 mils a minute on my neonate, oh yeah, you know, that blood is, is in the plastic tons longer on the, on the neonate. So the blood plastic interaction uh, is going to be very large. Mm -hmm. Even though we've reduced the components as much as we possibly can, the oxygenator is obviously smaller, uh, you still are gonna have much more plastic interaction than you would with the neonate. So uh, you can go lower on the heparin and the, and the anticoagulation on these adults with super high flows. Mm -hmm. The patient that we kind of keep talking about from North Carolina, she keeps popping up. Um, at the end of that year, they went away from heparin altogether and they were only giving her a daily aspirin. Wow. No, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. So it, she did fine. They had to change out her circuit about once every two weeks, but other than that, it was fine. And it has everything to do with super high flows. Mm -hmm. She was on, you know, five, six liters a minute. Um, and that had a, you know, a lot to do with it. Wow, that's impressive, that's impressive. It's very impressive. Makes you think about that little 81 milligram aspirin you pop every night, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it does, if that'll do all that. Okay, so let's circle back around to 2009 and talk a little bit about the history of what's going on and why the adult care is exploding and why pediatric world is kind of stabilized out. In 2009, we started getting a lot of reports out of New Zealand and Australia that a lot of the pregnant women were being attacked by this novel, what they thought was a novel uh, virus. It was H1N1 influenza, and so they came back to us and told us that they were having to put 2.6 cases of, for per million population on ECMO just to save them, and they ended up with 77% survival, which was really, really awesome. Mm -hmm. So we extrapolated out, well, because you know, winter down there, summer up here, and we're, so we're sitting around in 2009 thinking, this winter is going to really be bad, and extrapolating out the different sizes and population, we were expecting about 800 cases here, and Europe was expecting about 1,300 cases. And up to this point, worldwide, we were only doing about 200 adult cases a year, ever, I mean, for everybody. And so now we're looking at having to do somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000. Everybody freaked out, started buying up lots and lots of equipment, started determining how in the world are we gonna, how we gonna do this. By the time the influenza came through Asia and came over to us, 
it had attenuated a lot. And so we got a lot of cases that year, but it wasn't near as bad as we thought it was going to be. But in addition to that, one cool thing was actually going on was Giles Peak, the same guy that was putting on that neonatal respiratory case that, uh, study that in Europe that we were talking about earlier, had also been spending the last four years up to this point putting together an adult version of that exact same study. So his, his target population was adult ARDS patients going on ECMO. And you can see the study here. 63% um, of the uh, ECMO patients lived, where 47% of the uh, control patients lived. So you can see the statistics there. P-value is 0.03. And these two things came out at the exact same time, the CSER trial in addition to the reports out of Australia. So people put this together and started coming up with uh, the thought process that adult ARDS does very well, responds very well to uh, ECMO. So as happens with uh, many, many things, a lot of people were changing their minds. We had a new generation of physicians that didn't have that same adult respiratory ECMO experience that we had back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, they're a new generation. They were forward thinkers. They said, why not try ECMO on these patients? So they did, and they started liking it, started having good results with it. And so now, fast forward to today, now we're putting all kinds of patients on these. Um, we've got cardiac, patient, cardiac centers that are putting just about every single patient that comes through their door, putting them on ECMO. So we're kind of getting back. The pendulum has kind of gone a little bit too far, and now we're putting all kinds of patients on that doesn't need to go on or patients that shouldn't go on. Mm -hmm. But that explains why that graph looks the way it does, heading, heading north at a, about a 60 degree angle. Mm -hmm. Here's a couple of quick little graphs I got from the CDC talking about last winter's influenza uh, uh, epidemic that came through. The orange ones, yeah, the orange one, the red, yeah, the orange ones at the top are the H1N1. As you can see, it's still around. And here's the uh, similar thing, but this is every single year going back about five or six years. The red at the top is uh, last year's. Mm -hmm. And the reason I brought this up was I was sitting around in an airport one day reading a USA Today that, you know, just bored. And I came across this article where a bunch of guys in Pennsylvania was digging in their backyard or on their farm and they found a bunch of bones. So they called the police and they said, we found a bunch of bones, what's this? And they came out and took a look and turns out it was a mass grave from the uh, Spanish flu influenza pandemic back in the 1918. Um, and you can see in the Smithsonian that they estimate somewhere between 50 and 100 million cases, 100 million people died worldwide wow. from the Spanish flu. Oh my God. So they took the bones and they took the bone marrow and they uh, did a sample and they found live H1N1 influenza. Oh my God. Right. Exactly right. Oh my God. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. It's still around and it's still deadly. So where are we going with all this? My, we're, we're developing modular ECLS components. Presently we've got cardiac, respiratory, and renal. We we're developing generation two ECMO pumps, which are simple, easy to, easy to uh, walk around with. Patient population, adult ECMO is going to use, ECMO use is going to increase dramatically. Vascular access, VV, is going to become the standard approach. We're developing thromboresistant circuits. Cardiac uh, ECMO is going to be being done at all centers because when a patient decompensates cardiac-wise, they need ECMO, they need it right that second. But respiratory ECMO, when a patient decompensates from a respiratory reason, they've got several hours before they actually need to go on ECMO. So what we'll probably start seeing are tertiary centers that specialize in respiratory ECMO mm -hmm. and lots and lots of centers all around that do cardiac ECMO. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Artificial placentas with uh, proper safety and knowledge, the patient population can, is going to change from the moribund to the moderately severe respiratory and cardiac failure. We're going to develop wearable and implantable devices for the lung and the heart, bridged to lung transplant for children and the adults, we've seen that already, <clears throat> and support during organ procurement after the brain death. There's been a couple of studies that have shown 
If you take a brain dead donor and you put them on ECMO right at the moment of death and highly oxygenate the organs, um, the, the rejection percentage is a lot less, particularly really? the, the pancreas. Really? So, conclusions. ECMO works, but we still do not know a lot about its basic disease, its natural history, or patient selection. We still have not gotten the most from what we already think we know. And we also know that there are the known unknowns, that is to say that we know that there are some things that we do not know, but there's also the unknown unknowns, the ones that we don't know that we don't know. Yep, Don, Don Rumsfeld, I've used that <laughs> quote. Have you really? It's a great quote, that's a great, <laughs> a great quote. It and is. that was an excellent, that was really a great presentation, and I appreciate this so very much. I think that was, that, that, that was a very comprehensive review of ECMO, and especially talk, because I talk about ECMO a lot, but I only talk about it in the adult world because I don't live in the pediatric world. I right. just don't. Right. Um, now, I, I believe that, yes, you can put an ECMO in too early. However, I mean, way too early, and, you know, okay. but okay. I believe by and large that when you see ARDS patient after ARDS patient after ARDS patient and you have that experience, you know from the trend where this is going to go, mm -hmm. almost predictably. Mm -hmm. So this argument that it's put in too early and the patient could have done fine without it, I think is a red herring. I don't think it's a good argument. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I, I believe that ECMO is still underutilized. Yes. That is what I still, I believe that from the VV perspective. The Correct. VA perspective, it's, you know, your mortality on that's going to be high. Um, yes. You're expected not to survive. But, and I think you do have to have some very, uh, very um, uh, specific criteria. You know, if you have a 45-year-old female or male that comes into your facility without any other, you know, uh, 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 comorbidity that would be exclusionary, um, I think we have an obligation. Look at what the French are doing. Put them on, putting people on ECMO in the in the Louvre. In the, the Louvre. Did you store. see that? Yes, I did. I have. That was awesome. Yes, I have. And. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, people deserve a, uh, an opportunity. They yes. deserve that chance. Now, yes. I think we have to be pragmatic. And at day five, when they're still on uh, max doses of epi and norepi and, uh, and, and uh, neo and uh, vasopressin. And they're and emptying out the blood bank. Right, and their or their or their uh, their lactate levels are going through the roof, and you're only clearing it because you have CRRT running at the maximum speed, and you know that their bowel is uh, infarcted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there there is a time you have to be able to say we've got to end this. Well, yeah, limits. There certainly needs to be limits. However, I think you're right. This is a modality that can be utilized to uh, treat these respiratory cases. Uh, and it's been shown uh, high, high probability of success, save the lungs, uh, and there's been studies that have shown that it's cost effective. Per day, it's a very, very expensive therapy. However, you take an ARDS patient, you throw him on ECMO, <clears throat> a week later he comes off ECMO, a week later he comes off the ventilator, a few days later he's out on the floor, and a few days after that he's walking home, mm -hmm. versus putting him on a ventilator and leaving him in the expensive ICU for months, Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you would definitely save money in the long run by utilizing, putting them on ECMO and yes. getting them well quicker and getting them out the door quicker. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the right thing to do from a societal perspective, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of the, 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 the uh, uh, in the interest of public safety. And, you know, the, the community, the community interest is these people um, are uh, contributing members of society, even whether they are or not, but they're human. And we have an obligation to help them and uh, and get them home with a reasonable quality of life. Uh, and it, you know, in fact, their 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 quality of life really should be at baseline. If they had an acute event, pneumonia, 
uh, developed ARDS and needed to be on Vino Vino uh, ECMO or had a sudden cardiac arrest, had, was, were revascularized um, and uh, were on VA ECMO until their uh, heart decided to, to get strong enough or they got uh, a VAD or whatever it may be and they can go on, look at our, one of our former vice presidents had a, uh, had a VAD in for a couple of years until he finally got a transplant and lived with it and went to the store and everything else. Mm -hmm. Had his grandchildren learning how to, learned how to, uh, how to change the battery. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a good thing that I wasn't one of his grandkids, but uh, that would have <laughs> been. Let's not a get into that. Would have been a different. I know I shouldn't make political statements, should I? <laughs> but uh, but anyway, with that said, let me touch the. You know, if we can close this out, I want to go ahead and touch the third rail, and uh, may as well do it. There's forty three hundred perfusionists. Oh, okay. Yes. How many? ECMO specialists are there, there whether it be oh. nurse ECMO specialists or respiratory ECMO specialists? I don't know that. and I'm, I'm, It's a lot. Uh, well, it, it potentially could be every single nurse, every single RT that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've trained them every single year. We have classes and I take RTs and nurses and perfusionists and teach them how to do ECMO. Uh, so, to answer your question, I mean, yeah, exponentially more mm -hmm. Uh, RTs and nurses, <clears throat> so teams that have that are blended and take advantage of all of the resources that they've got um, have a much larger pool of talent to pull from mm -hmm. uh, uh, for staffing and just knowledge base. So when you say blended program, you mean programs that incorporate both perfusion and ECMO specialists working together yes. to solve these these needs. Exactly right. Um, and exactly I think right. that, to me, I think that makes a lot of sense. Now let me ask you another question if I can, because I mean, it's a big problem. Look, it is it is the truly the third rail. There are perfusionists that believe only perfusionists should manage ECMO. There, but but if you, li if you work in a community hospital with three perfusionists doing 300 cases a year, let's say, um, and one of them is on vacation, and you put an ECMO in. Who's going to sit it? That's two of them, twelve hours a day. That means you're not operating. You shut the cath lab down. Talk about not being very cost effective. So that population of perfusionists that think that is that getting smaller and smaller as time goes by. I think so, and I think I think so. I think it's getting smaller and smaller because, and I find this to be, of course. You know, for me, I am a perfusionist, and I'm very proud of I'm my sorry. profession. I'm <laughs> sorry. That wasn't appropriate, oh. but I'll let it go. Um, I was going to invite you to dinner for doing this for us, but I've since reconsidered that idea. But thank you. Couldn't get um, into a good school? I'm sorry? You couldn't get into a good school? I couldn't get into a good school. And so uh, uh didn't know you then, or I would have had you teach me. I think I'm a little older than you, but you could have still taught me in embryo, you know. Um, but... Uh, I, it's surprisingly how perfusion training no doesn't really encompass that. There's a lot of perfusionists that I know who are both um, experienced, uh, and when I say experienced, I mean 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. and those that are newer graduates who have zero experience with ECMO. They're not taught ECMO as part of the core curriculum. So that first night where they get told, oh, you're sitting the ECMO pump tonight, they walk in expecting to use their OR skills? To we don't know what they, well, I don't know what they, so we just don't, do, we can't do that. You know, we would, we would have to go through a process of training. We okay. wouldn't, just because they have a, uh, a technically a license to do this doesn't mean, I mean, you could if you were in a big institution like this, Te theoretically, you could do that because there's a lot of resources around. Mm. Uh, but even in this institution where we are here at Houston Methodist, they use ECMO specialists here. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes nurses at the bedside who are, I think in some cases, where they are uh, managing the ECMO patient without an additional nurse ECMO or, or RT ECMO specialist, either mm -hmm. one, uh, it taking care of the ECMO itself. Mm -hmm. I think you can do that if you're using a system uh, that you are almost assured 
nothing can happen other mm -hmm. than complete failure, in which case it doesn't matter who's there. Um, but uh, but by, mm -hmm. and there always is a perfusionist in house here. That's another thing. They're mm -hmm. always in house somewhere. Right, right. And so I think that's why they feel that that they can do that. And I think they can. I think you can do that. But when you are in a community-based hospital where you're on call and 30 minutes away and there is nobody in house um, and something uh, the thing does clot off, let's say, mm. um, you know, even though it's going to be a fire drill, if you have to wait the additional 30 minutes, that may not be the best scenario. So what do we do? We try to make sure that doesn't happen, but it can. It can, I mean, it can happen. Look, you know, the drip could get infiltrated and uh, or get turned off inadvertently mm -hmm. or whatever happens. Well, this is and, Houston. Uh, we get tropical storms. We get hurricanes. We know. We had, uh, that, we had that experience. With power battery. goes out, and now six hours later, your battery's dead. Yeah. And your perfusionist can't get to you because they're flooded in. Right. What do you do? Right. They have to know how to manage. Exactly. Right. Exactly. But I think that's part of the training that we need. And I agree with you. I think we do need blended programs. I think it's the mm -hmm. only way we're going to do this. Let me, uh, let me ask you, and I'd like to revisit this again, because I think ECMO is such a, such an, a, 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 a topic of interest for the medical community right now that I think we could do another ECMO program and really talk about uh, what is the best training and talk about not just the physiologic aspects of it and the patient selection aspects of it, but how to actually have an ECMO program, whether you be in a large tertiary center like this or your center, or you are in a more community-based setting. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of people because ECMO utilization is going to continue to rise. Yes, and I have said this, I don't know how many times, we are one epidemic away from not being able to manage all of these patients because too many perfusionists think they're the only ones that can do it and now they're not gonna be able to and we're not training enough uh, ECMO specialists in order to be able to fill that void. That's my opinion. No, I think it's a valid a point. We, uh, as you know, you can't, it, it's not an overnight training. There has to be some investment on many people's part, uh, time, money, energy, equipment. Uh, it can't be, uh, you know, there's an epidemic in Australia and it's going to be here in six months. You know, it's going to take that long just to get everybody up and trained and get the equipment, you know, in-house. So, no, you're exactly right. Something to think about, something to move forward to. And um, a lot of these community hospitals that are doing uh, ECMO that aren't part of ELSO, um, you know, they're, they're, they're the ones that we need to support. We need to uh, help them with their training and help them with that uh, knowing what they need to know, mm -hmm. uh, including simulation labs and, and all knowing of that. Knowing what they need to know because they don't know what they don't know. That's right. So uh, one last question. I philosophically believe that if a patient has an, is, in, is septic, they have had pneumonia, now they have they've set their septic, they're in ARDS, they're on ECMO, um, that that system should not be left up for two weeks. That after, what do the nurses do every 72 hours? They change all of their IV tubing. Why do they do that? It's infection control. So generally speaking, I prefer to use a less expensive uh, polypropylene fiber uh, uh, oxygenator and change it once it becomes wetted out and oh, uh, okay. go ahead and change it. Okay. Uh, and every time I do change an ECMO circuit, I always notice the patients pick up. Now, maybe that's not every patient, but certainly the ones that are, that are septic. Okay. The polymethylpentene fibers, of course, will, aren't, don't react to lipids. They last a lot longer. You can use propofol, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's your opinion on how I feel about that and whether you like the, uh, the, uh, the polypropylene filter or the PMP filter? I like the, the polymethylpentene ones better. And the mm -hmm. reason I like it is just in patient safety. Um, I know that that oxygenator is going to last a lot longer than the uh, others. That you start getting uh, plasma drip, you start losing proteins, you start uh, but we running the it by risk. Bed. 
Okay. As soon All as right. that happens, we're going to change it. So now you've exposed the patient to a whole new set of plastic. Uh, they go through the inflammation process all over again. Uh, so, and that's the argument. I know. And I know it's I the know, argument. I know. But the and now, flip side of that argument is every one of those connectors, and there are multiple places within that oxygenator that are static. There's no flow. Yes. And you have infected blood that is stuck in there that cannot be treated. You're treating the patient. And does that not continue to be a nidus for continued infection? Okay. So with that in mind, maybe that's the impetus for a new design. You, you combine the two ideas. No stagnant blood. You, you redesign the, so there is no uh, infected blood not doing anything. Well, I think with the utilization of ECMO going up the way it is, the money is there for them to R&D this. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm being told, oh, we went 15 minutes over. I, I think that's great. This was a very good conversation. I enjoyed it very much. And uh, uh, I want, again, Kurt, I want to thank you so much for oh, doing this well, thank for Thank you us. for your time. It has been I, absolutely